Once upon a time, there was a little boy who used to collect sticks and sand. <laughs> yes, that's what I did as a kid, and I'd drag it all home and build a little diorama in the corner of the yard, and then one day a big rainstorm would come along and wash it all away. And then later on in life, when I, much later, I began to realize, hey, why don't I create another rainstorm like this? Throw paint on, oh, I don't like that. Wash it down, wash it down. And then walk away and it dries and go, hey, wow, look at that. Who did that? Okay, so how's everybody doing? So the beach, right? The beach. Yeah, that previous photo was the beach I grew up on as a kid and uh, used to hang around a lot. Well, even into my young adult life. The 60s, 70s, the, there was a beach fire every Friday night through the weekend, every you know, 20 yards along that beach, all the way from Kitsilino to to uh, past Spanish Banks to Wreck Beach until that all got shut down. But anyway, fast forward to uh, 2021 and here we are and I brought the beach home, right? <laughs> okay, so I wanted to share some clips about how I did this uh, particular uh, beach scene, the sand and the rock so uh, I just got to figure out the best way to do it because there's some questions here I just want to address and since I'm doing this sort of open vlog style then you know I want to be able to address questions like usually I'll write to them but then most of the community has to read every comment to find out not everybody has the luxury of time and neither do I because every hour is squeezed and since I brought that up about hours how many hours on the layout a week somebody asked well, I probably a couple hours every day for sure, like modeling. That's just modeling. Okay, so I'll figure that out two times seven, 15, 15 to 20 hours a week, and then triple that for production, video production, reshoots, etc. Uh, post production editing. Oops, I gotta do this clip, I gotta reshoot that. It's just like a mini film. Like that's the way a YouTube channel is when you're a content crea a creator you get sucked into that vortex whether you like it or not right and uh, if you want to be have a successful niche channel and that's all this channel really is right now so so I want to respect the community and those that subscribe and support the channel those most specifically that watch a commercial uh, like I get the commercial thing sometimes they're redundant but they do the algorithm does give new commercials according to each person's interest though so every time you watch a commercial, I get 10 cents, right? So it's, it's not much, but it does help to justify my time. Okay, so that's that question, and I've got four more that I'll quickly deal with, and I'll move on to the beach here uh, in the reef. So somebody mentioned about operations, you know, what kind of operations, um, you know, is are you going to conduct? Well, that, like, I don't give that a lot of thought, but... Like the layout itself, uh, if you go back in the content, and most people know, for sure that the subscribers do, uh, that uh, there's loads of potential for operation on this 26 foot, two foot deep layout. It's an interchange, right? There uh, will, will be three uh, runaround tracks as passing sightings. There's an interchange. There's possibly a classification yard entry to a cassette on each end, one being a ferry facade, the other one being just a cassette where cars will be will go and enter the layout from the you know inland portion of the imagination. So there's loads of potential. And then you know the barge slip itself for all the island services and logging caps, you know, it goes on and on. So if your philosophy isn't based on a shelf layout to begin with, then you're not really going to understand the concept of operations on a small footprint like this. Okay, so I hope that helps that question. And then there was also the question of, uh, attached that one, like, why does the rock end here and then a black void? If that's what they meant. If they meant uh, down here at this end, well, there is room for a barge to slip on. Uh, that can be revised, the end is a portable. But the main emphasis is the barge route, which is hardly in service anyway. Okay. And if it's this black void right here, this is exactly like the prototype. The concrete slab is inset further. The reason why the rock comes out like this, just like this, it probably tapers uh, maybe just right to the center of this block or so. But if the rock, this is man-made, so if the rock break with the tide coming this way, 
isn't out here. It's going to wash the whole slab away, right? Like that's why it's like that. And then you got the current coming in the tide and then the rip coming down. So that's why this, this is prototypical. Just go check out uh, Google Earth, uh, Anasis Island, and uh, you'll find this barge slip. I've left links for it. And uh, I'll even show photos if I have to to prove that. Okay, so there you see it. You see how this rock work is just like that, right? Okay, so that's the way it is according to the prototype. The only probably difference I applied artistic license is there's another extension of the reef here even. It comes out rock. It's sort of very rectangular. And I didn't think, well, for one, it wouldn't fit completely on the footprint. And I thought just part of it just wouldn't look right. Some things in the real world just do not look good on a model. I mean, I think a lot of you are aware of that. Like a, a, a mangled tree might be real in the real world, but why would we model that unless it was essential? You know, we like everything, like when we see cinematography and imagery and photos that strike us, it's because it's the best of the real world applied artistically. And so that's my approach uh, to the model railroad shelf layout too. And in this case, that's why I did this. Now this will probably get like this, like this is done as you see it, but there's going to be lots of, like I'll show you another prototype photo of this section. Okay, so you can see this is all sort of foliage, like uh, aquatic type plants. So it'll be up and down with the tide, right? Because the tide actually goes up to this green piece of tape here. That's the common tide uh, without a flood. You know, the flood would have done this down here, right? Because the Fraser does that at, at times. It can be, get incredibly high if it's a hot spring with all the water in, in southern BC coming down. So this is going to get flushed out more with foliage and green. Like I haven't really done any green on the layout yet, but that'll come in another phase. So that addresses that question, okay? So, and then uh, there was the one... Um, where does the track go, like, further down that way? Well, the track will go further to Module C, which I haven't addressed yet. That hasn't been fully planned, although it's on my drawing up there, but covered by the warehouse, right? Okay. Um, that is, I'm not even going to address that till next year. So, and another thing is, too, is I'm not going to rush this project. Like, I'm not in a hurry to just, you know, paint the whole thing earth and just, you know cookie cutter everything and shake and bake the scenery on that's that's not the concept of this channel at all so just so people know like you know you're welcome you know <laughs> like I want you here to be part of this but that's not the approach to this channel at all or the genre of this type of modeling okay all right then uh, now uh, there's the road by the siding which was brought up uh, that uh, it's going to be addressed, probably mostly overgrown. The road over there uh, that go, sort of goes to nowhere would, would would have been an attempt to service that siding, but I'm just going to grow it in with heavy grass and so on to deal with that. And then last but not least that I didn't want to deal with yet, but I'm almost there, is about the water. Now, I already described it in some of the comments, but once again, not everybody's going to see them. Look, I have a whole list of reasons why I hate Envirotex resin, okay? Do you really want to hear them? Okay, so I'm going to deal with this water question because it's going to come up more and more. And uh, look, some of you are going to disagree with this, and that's okay. You're allowed to. And uh, you might even hear in my tone that I just hate that stuff. I hate what it does to a model. And it does things to models, really good ones out there too, that the modeler knows consciously in the back of their mind and probably wishes they didn't do it, but it's too late. Once you pour that epoxy stuff, it's too late. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of reasons. Uh, if I go to pour this whole surface right here, I got to make sure there's not one pinhole all along the bank back there. 
and then I got a dam. I got to build a dam up, right? Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to have an edge uh, that I got to deal with. Uh, that's going to show, like this finished edge. Like I'm a big fan of nice corners and finish. So I'm not going to deal with multimedia here, resin and then wood, shrinking wood and then resin and cracks along here. There's no way that's going to happen, right? And why would I pour a thin layer then when I can do that with artist medium and control it? I can be in control. You can't control that resin. Like I know people use it for block, you know, they, they pour a block of the sea monster down. That's great. That's a better application for it. But for pouring into a big void to simulate water just because we think it looks like water, uh, not for me. And here's another reason, the big one. If I poured resin on here, like a quarter inch, let's say it's going to ruin this whole gradual slope, like this wet sand, like it'll creep up into here. Furthermore, it creeps up into any vertical, any vertical uh, um, surface. It doesn't matter. It could be corrugated metal. It could be the side of a canal. Could be the shoreline of a river. People try to fix it by sprinkling sand. It doesn't look right because it curls up like this, right? And it suck. It it wicks up into everything. It's called resin creep, and it's a horrible curse. You'll just ruin a good model. Uh, not to mention this barge slip too. I would never epoxy that in place. And uh, why would I want to clamp it down or pull it down tight over top of resin? Because I got another quarter inch I got to deal with. So now I got to change the whole approach, right? Like right here, don't I? right see there's always a reason no way man like no resin on this resin ruins a good model i don't know why people are so infatuated with that stuff to be honest with you like this is okay this is my polemic right no resin ever on boomers dioramas never ever right maybe a pond or a ditch on the side i would make an exception but if you here just let me jump off this for a second here so if you pour resin into this it's going to crawl up all into everywhere. It's going to creep up and ruin. Look, I know people do it. And if you look at it, like go look at some of the really top modelers out there, the very talented modelers that have done it. And they won't admit it probably, but they know like that little creep where the light hits it and it flashes back. It just, it's a sore. It's an eyesore. Sorry, but I'm going to call it for what it is. You can do water surface, most water surfaces, okay, with paint and artist gels, just as effective. And it looks better because the whole thing is paint. It has continuity through the whole thing, not this uh, high gloss, out of scale glare that uh, some might say, oh, look, the train reflection is in it. Really? Uh, the Muddy Fraser, there's no depth clarity. You can't see into it two inches, so why would you use it? You know, like, why would I want to use that stuff? So, no, I won't be using two-part Envirotex toxic resin, okay? Now, just before I move on to uh, the, the beach, you know, uh, development part here, these are four colors that I like to use by Model Laird Vallejo. And these I use for dry brushing. This is sand. Okay, here's the number. Here's aged white, and here's white, okay? That's what I use to dry brush to bring out all this detail right here. That's what you see. And all those little ribs and stuff, that's all the sand. The sand does that. I'll show you that. When, when you wet it down and then you chase it with uh, matte medium, it does all that. That's why I'm going to show you a clip. I really, really think this stuff is just fantastic. Also, this cement right here, if you're wondering about this rock work and how I tied that in, I just took this cement, very highly, highly diluted, okay, with water. Never isopropyl I use for this, by the way. Never. Just water. It's not fully compatible with isopropyl. Some concentrations, if it's, if it's heavily diluted, it is, but it's risky. Uh, especially in your airbrush, it's more difficult to clean if it dries in there. I just put a thin wash with a, you know, traditional brush, just a thin, thin wash. You can hardly see it when it dries. It'll, it'll just go flat like that. And it just ties it in, takes away that raw rock look and, and renders it artistically, you know, with the color continuity that, you know, 
we're always after when we want to pursue realistic scenery, right? Okay. Okay, so I just want to show you this product here uh, that I've had uh, for quite some time. It's aluminum oxide abrasive. Originally, it was for the Badger Airy Racers. I don't know if for those of you boomers, probably you might uh, remember that. Badger had a little Airy Racer. Of course, you need a good compressor to, for it to be effective. They wouldn't work on the basic style. But anyway, there was a little gun. I think Pache made one too. I have one, but it doesn't really work that well anymore. But anyway, um, I used to use this for... Um, for you know removing layers of paint it was really nice for weathering for doing faded paint my goodness you know but it's a bit messy you got to mask up and stuff but um but i had a few tubs around and i always knew one day that i would use it and you can see how i what i did was is i just sprinkled it in the rocks here just to get it level because this is tough to for this transition here for it to look right you know like sand's been washed up and then it settles so i just laid it in dry and moved it around with a brush right you know what I mean? So just, you know, just sort of stabbing it in to the rocks there and then I tamped it down. And then I just basically took, you know, the spray bottle and I misted it down. And then I uh, just soaked it down with my dropper bottle there with matte medium. Got it really wet and then, you know, a little bit of it flooded along here and I just mopped up. But man, like this morning, oh, it's just so nice. Like, it's a really nice sand texture and you can work this in with the, you know, the coarse molding paste as well as another level uh, if you're into that kind of thing. But uh, I'm really liking that. So for a good base there, sand. So it'll get close to paint here. So, okay.
So I've got a lot of the colors in now like that I want with the airbrush later I came in and just played around a bit and I will probably might put another wash at the end it doesn't matter what uh, sequence you do them really uh, I find that I like I'll put washes on I'll airbrush I'll put more washes on whatever just until it I get it right now this is all all the shadow earthy tones so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little sh well I'm gonna show you uh, with a little bit of sand beige here uh, by Vallejo Okay, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little dry brush and I'll show you what happens, uh, how it makes things pop. And then I use a dry rag, right, with a brush like this, okay. I wipe it almost till it's wipe it off really good and then just try it on something too much a very little paint you want See how it picks up all the little details now? Okay. The trick is to do it in layers again. Don't overdo it. Because if you overdo it, it won't look right. The art of dry brushing is uh, a, a dry brush <laughs> and uh, try to stay away from white if you can. I use white at the very end on, on a particular situation, it depends. See I can even go across these rocks here because there's so many colors, you know, transitioning back and forth with tide and so on. And this uh, sandy beige is a really nice color for... Uh, dry brushing stones and see what makes them pop there. So the trick is very little, right? It's the same as the armor modelers, you know, they understand this principle. That's why I always try to encourage the armor modeler to get into the scenery. Well, some of them are, I mean, I used to do it, the diorama thing. Um, see that picks up all that texture real nice that you wouldn't otherwise see. Right? You can do this with oils as well because the oils will stay wetter longer but I really like the acrylics so once you get a feel for them. Oh look at that. It's just all that detail that you didn't know was there. See? So the trick is to build it up. Right? Some will, will keep lightening their color you know over and over again, but you don't have to do that uh, with earth colors. I find that you can, uh, if you have three or four already laid in, and like I say, the uh, this is a nice color. This really, really nice color. I really like these colors here. Like this is uh, Paleo Air, right? You can shoot it through your airbrush, but I rarely do. Like I don't shoot Vallejo, I just shoot Tamiya because it cleans easy with isopropyl. And Vallejo Air is not very isopropyl friendly. It, does a, it sort of coagulates a bit sometimes. It depends on the alcohol concentration. This is a really nice color, cement gray. I really like this color. The nice thing about Vallejo is, you know, like you see the rack, they got like 500 colors. And you know, I mean, let's face it, not everybody wants to mix their own colors and shades. And there's very unique colors in the Vallejo line. Like they really have quite a system there. And uh, I think a lot of armor modelers use them now because of, uh, you know, this. I mean, look at the, I'm liking this because a lot of the sand on the Fraser is quite dark. Yeah. Unless it's a sandbar further up that's beyond the tidal zone, but when you've got the tide coming back and forth all the time, washing up and down, it has a darker tone to it. So 
See, I could have left it natural, but you see what that does, right? Isn't that nice? See the difference, sir? Okay, so there you have the beach.